the, the reason that um, we come here, and I talk about this a lot, is that many of us have discovered that we're not the best God in our life. That, that we tried to take things, we tried to think we were in control, we tried to do life our way, and honestly, at one point, we just had to go, you know what, this isn't working. And not only was it obvious to everybody around us, but it was obvious to ourselves, missing. And so we come to a place like this and we try to find out what the answer is. And we think if we gain knowledge, that somehow we'll develop a relationship. We think if we can have information, if we can follow a religion, if you can just give us a few rules to follow, maybe somehow that'll fix me. And what happens is we begin to understand that this is not about religion. It's not about church. It's about Jesus and a relationship and he created us because he wanted us to understand him and and he told us that he, he he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand all truth in other words instead of having Jesus as a Messiah walking over in the Holy Land God himself is inside of his believers guiding prompting teaching changing moving and we've been studying the Holy Spirit this is week I think it's week 10 of this series. Um, and, and basically the series has been about understanding who the Holy Spirit is. And then we're moving towards the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And last week I began to talk about this word that freaks everybody out called charisma or charismatic. And I told you that in the original language, what that word meant was people who've received wonderful gifts that they didn't deserve. So how many of us think we're charismatic? I've given gifts that I didn't deserve. And last week I began to talk about baptism. And if you missed that, I'd encourage you to go back because we talked a lot about what baptism means and what it represented both before Jesus arrived and after Jesus came and died and resurrected. And I said last week that in scripture, there are clearly three different baptisms. And many people sort of said, I'm not sure about that, but there's three. We went through it. Two last week, and you return this week because you want to hear about the third one, I hope. We said last week that when you study baptism in Scripture, that you need to pay attention to who's being baptized, who's doing the baptism, what people are being baptized into, and when they're being baptized. And so we identified last week the first two baptisms. Baptism number one was by the Holy Spirit into Christ. It occurs the moment you repent. As soon as you say, Jesus, I need you, I'm a sinner, and you confess and repent, you are baptized, the Bible says, into Christ. You are forever changed. The Holy Spirit immerses you into Christ. And in Ephesians, Paul says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. We are baptized into Christ. It's our conversion. We call it our, our born again experience. No longer dead in Christ, healed, not yet delivered. The second baptism is the one that most of us are familiar with. The second baptism is by believers into water. It's at the moment of our consecration. In other words, it's when we say, you know what, I believe in Christ and in obedience to Christ, I'm getting baptized in water. And I want you to know that it is my life desire to pursue his holiness. Not by my power, but by the power of the hope out of this water. And I'm coming after you because I'm bringing the gospel message to the world. I'm all in. We've been talking about that moment in your life when you realize you're all in that you can't go back, that you're forever changed. Paul continues, By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He died, buried, raised to new life. The symbolism of water baptism for believers is that we're identifying with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. As Christ came out of the tomb to change the world, we come out of our tomb symbolically to change the world through his power. Dead, buried, raised to new life. That's the symbol of water baptism. So those are the first two baptisms. And I said last week, there's not much argument about these. Many people don't call their conversion experience a baptism, but the scriptures clearly do. 
So when you talk to most believers, we're cool. It's all good. Yes, I had a conversion experience. I was born again. I received the Holy Spirit. And then out of obedience, I decided I wanted to be baptized in water. Yes, I get it. The first baptism secures your uh, um, salvation, true repentance, true brokenness, true surrender. Genuine trust in what Jesus did on the cross, surrendering our life to Christ, saves us, period. That's all, faith. You're saved by faith. Your, sal your salvation never hinges on any other baptism. Additional baptisms are like icing on the cake. They allow you to be more effective witnesses for Christ. If someone says your salvation depends upon you being baptized in water or being baptized in the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues, they have grossly misinterpreted scripture. Pull them aside away from those who are seeking. I said this last week, kindly in love, redirect them to the criminal on the cross. Never baptized, never spoke in tongues in paradise with Jesus, guaranteed by Jesus. But then we get to the third baptism. And everybody starts to kind of, oh, third baptism, okay. This baptism, according to scripture, is by Jesus into the Holy Spirit. How well supported is this third baptism? Well, all four gospels include it. Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit and fire. All four gospel writers are led by the Holy Spirit to about a baptism that is clearly different from the first two we've talked about. This baptism is done by Jesus. He will baptize you, future tense. In this baptism, we've already been baptized into Christ. We're believers. We're born again. We're not being baptized in water. We're being baptized into the Holy Spirit. The image here is Jesus immersing us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus affirms this truth. You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Clearly, there is a moment that Jesus planned for the disciples to immerse them in the Holy Spirit. Very clear in Scripture. So just to recap, baptism number one, by the Holy Spirit, into Jesus, repentance, salvation, secure. Baptism number two, by believers, into water, consecration, I'm pursuing holiness. Baptism number three, by Jesus, into the Holy Spirit and fire, empowered for witnessing. So let's look at the first century context and see if we can begin to understand. People heard about Jesus and repented. They were baptized in John's baptism we talked about last week. They were baptized in water. But while Jesus was on earth, they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't here yet. Jesus had the power of the Holy Spirit in his ministry, but nobody else had received the Holy Spirit yet. In fact, Jesus said the Holy Spirit could not come until he himself left. So those who lived and responded live received, repented, and believed and were baptized in John's baptism of water. Okay, is that clear? Okay. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit when they believed because they couldn't. He hadn't arrived yet. Okay, we're talking about people who lived during the time of Jesus. Today, when we repent, we immediately receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They could not yet. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So there were a group of people who listened to Jesus teach before he died, and they believed and they followed John's baptism. They did the best they could possibly do, but the Holy Spirit had not yet come to empower them. Okay, today, as soon as we believe... We receive the Holy Spirit. However, as soon as Jesus could give them the Holy Spirit, he did. 
Look at this odd passage that occurred probably on the evening of his resurrection. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. That brings back images of God breathing into Adam. New life. And then 40 days later, Jesus said to them, you heard this from me, most valid source in the world. John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. Essentially saying you have repented, you have been consecrated, but you lack something. in Jerusalem and in all Judea with Samaria to the end of the earth. To fully understand this topic, we have to understand the unique issues facing the disciples. They believed in Jesus. He's right there with them. He's God. He's the Messiah. He's right there. They received John's baptism, symbolizing their repentance in water. They have a desire to want to be clean. They have a desire to want to follow Jesus. That baptism is not by the Holy Spirit because he wasn't here yet. That, baptiz that baptism of John did not have been in resurrection because he hasn't done it yet. Their salvation is walking next to them. They believe in him. They don't need the Holy Spirit yet because he's right there with them then he died and on the day Jesus resurrects he breathes into his disciples the Holy Spirit symbolizing how God breathed life into Adam you see they would need the Holy Spirit during the next 40 days not because they needed power but because God's going to teach them you see, God spent 40 days after his resurrection teaching the disciples everything. They needed the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the teachings that were coming. He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus had said, look, you'll understand more when the Holy Spirit is here to teach you. So during those 40 days, he breathed into them the Holy Spirit so they could understand the scriptures, but they did not yet have power. He told them to wait. Now, theologically, they're caught up. They did it in a weird way, but they're caught up. They've repented. They believed. They've been baptized into water. They've been reborn like Adam directly from the breath of Christ, they are now in Christ and they've received the Holy Spirit. Okay? They've completed baptism number one and number two. They did it in a weird way. So by the time Jesus resurrects and goes back to heaven, his disciples have essentially had baptism number one, they believe they repented, they were born again, and baptism number two, they've been baptized in water. And they've received the Holy Spirit so they could understand the teaching. They just had to do it in steps based on the availability of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you don't have to go into all the details, but I want you to understand that when Jesus ascends, they are essentially baptized in Christ and in water. But he tells them there's another baptism coming. This one's in the Holy Spirit. Go wait for it. The Holy Spirit fell on them. We studied this for three weeks just as it had been promised through scripture for the purpose of giving them power. They were already reborn. They needed power to reach the world with the message of Jesus. 
Jesus said, look, don't go represent me until you've received power from on high. Once that power fell on them, they spoke in tongues, they witnessed, and those listening to the Gospels were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and others, what shall we do? In other words, we realize we've sinned. We realize we killed the Messiah. What should we do? And Peter said, repent. Be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Three things. Okay, so it seems clear from Scripture that the disciples experienced three baptisms in the unique way because of the presence or absence of the Holy Spirit at different times in their life. Okay, they had to go through it differently because the Holy Spirit had not yet fully arrived. Jesus had to breathe him into them. But maybe that was just for the disciples. Maybe this was just a first century one-time thing. I mean, there were unusual circumstances in the first century. Were they the only ones to receive this third baptism? This unique time window that closed? The time between Jesus' resurrection and the arrival of the Holy Spirit forever, was there no longer a need for the third baptism? If I repent and I'm baptized in Christ, and I'm a new spiritual being, and I'm eternal and saved, and I have the Holy Spirit, didn't I get all of him? Is there a need for a third baptism in the time of the, after the time of the disciples? Well... Scripture interprets Scripture. Now, can I just tell you, you're going to need to go back and listen to this again. I'm just telling you. Maybe five times. I don't know. You're going to have to go back and listen to it. You can go online and print it. Go slow. It'll click. I'm going to try to make it click live. In order to understand Scripture, we have to look at other Scripture. The first place you go to understand something you don't understand in the Bible is the Bible. Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Peter had been sent to the house of Cornelius. He was an Italian Gentile who feared God, and they were in Caesarea by the sea. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Hmm. And the believers from among the circumcised who come with Peter were amazed. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So they're there with a bunch of non-Jewish people. The Jews believe this message of Jesus was just for the Jews. And all, all of a sudden these Gentiles believe and the Holy Spirit falls on them. And they speak in tongues and they're beginning to praise Jesus. They repented, they believed, the Holy Spirit fell on them when they responded to the gospel. What's interesting is they received the first baptism and then immediately the third. We believe, Holy Spirit fell on them in that moment and they spoke in tongues. Look at what Peter says next. Can any with, anyone withhold water baptizing these people? This is we have. In other words, what he's saying is, look, they've received one and three. Can anybody say that because they received one and three, they can't have two? That's not how he said it, but that's what he's saying. And he commanded them to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. They've been baptized by Jesus into the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. They were praising God just like the Jews had done at Pentecost. The miraculous display of tongues convinced the Jews who were there that the Holy Spirit had truly fallen on the Gentiles. Without the display of tongues, they wouldn't have believed it. Without the display of tongues, they would not have believed it. It's the miracle that stamped that this was of God. Then notice that Peter made sure they didn't miss the second baptism in water by believers in the name of Jesus. So this baptism in the Holy Spirit is not unique to the disciples. It wasn't a one-time thing. It wasn't unique to just Jewish people. It had fallen on the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead to Acts 19. Paul is at Ephesus. Many years later, Pentecost has come, 
Paul is in Ephesus. We're years after the resurrection of Christ. Paul encounters disciples that were believers. Look at what he asked them. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the island country and came to Ephesus. And he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Hmm. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 in all. Paul seems to clearly understand that someone can come to faith in Jesus and not receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He knows that a person can be baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, salvation, the first baptism, and not be baptized by Jesus into the Holy Spirit, the third baptism. They, had, they were right there. We believe in Christ. We did the best we could. We took John's baptism. He said one was to come. Believing in a Messiah to come does not save you today. Jewish people believe in a Messiah to come today. And they missed him, right? So what he's saying is, look, John came and we all repented. We all got baptized in water because we were waiting for the Messiah. But there's a moment when you got to go, that is the Messiah right there. And I believe in him. Okay. So what they're saying is, and I love their answer. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul says, well, what were you baptized into? Paul affirms John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. And then he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. And then through laying on the hands, the Holy Spirit. Note that it's Samaria and here in Ephesus, the third baptism came through the laying on of hands and was manifested by speaking in tongues. Two for two. Twice they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, twice they spoke in tongues. Looks like all believers are getting this third baptism and speaking in tongues. Or are they? Acts chapter 8. Stephen has been martyred. Philip heads to Samaria and revival breaks out. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now this is the story of Simon the Magician. If you remember Simon the Magician, He's one of those who believe. Philip went to him, preached the good news. The Holy Spirit convicted them, baptism number one. They were baptized into water, baptism number two. Do you remember what stirred up Simon the magician? Look at what happens next. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And we have a group of people here responding to the preaching of the Yet in this passage, it is obvious Simon knew they had received the Holy Spirit. He laid hands on them and he knew they had received the Holy Spirit. But there's no mention of tongues. Could have been tongues. It could have been obvious in some other way. The scriptures don't tell us. And where the word of God is silent, we remain silent. So they all seem to receive this third baptism. The spirit falls on believers. Sometimes manifested in tongues. like it, Or at Caesarea with the Gentiles. Or those at Ephesus. But not always. In Samaria, these stories described in scripture. No one debates that they occurred. The controversy regarding baptism of the Holy Spirit is not, did it happen? It clearly happened. The controversy is, does it happen today? That's the issue. That's the sticky wicket. In other words, this third baptism, was that just for people who lived in the first century? Or is it normal and expected experience for all believers for all time? Scriptures seem to support a third baptism. Baptism. 
But it's very unclear whether that extends past the early church. And it may not be supported, depending on how you look at Scripture. And it's hotly debated. So there's a group of believers who are what are called apostolic only. What they would say is the gifts, speaking in tongues, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit were a first century event and ended at the end of the first century. And they would say that they ended because the apostles were gone, the word of God was here, and there was no further need to validate the message, the word of God was already validated. And you may be going, oh yeah, that's exactly right. Or you may be going, no, there's no way that's right. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't matter. Many who love Jesus strongly disagree, not with the third baptism, but that that baptism is for all believers. They state that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a promise, not a command, that it was a, a, something that happened in the first century, but doesn't happen forever, that it was promised by Jesus in Luke 24, and it was completed in Acts chapter 2. They believe that Acts reflects a transition period, a very unusual time when there was a window of time when people believed in Jesus, saved because of their faith, baptized in water, but they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit because Jesus is still here. As a result, they believe that during this unique period of time, baptism served two purposes, bring the Holy Spirit to believers, show non-believers that what's happening is really of God. They believe the miraculous signs and acts were simply to validate the message of the apostles. Once Jesus left, he was no longer there to perform miracles. And they would argue that the new message of the gospel had to be validated. There had to be something that told the people after Jesus left that the message is true and it's from God. Once the message was launched and these miracles occurred, there's no need to continue them. They would say that just like the miracles by Moses, they were for a time and a purpose. They argue that Acts is a book that details the supernatural origin of the church, that God used supernatural things during the first century to jumpstart the gospel message, to validate that it was truly his message, and to validate that it was for people other than Jews as well. That without speaking in tongues, without the manifestations of the Spirit, the audience would not have known that this came from God. They argue that Acts tells the story of the early church, but it's not a doctrinal book. Much like Exodus telling the story of God's people, but not defining standard operating procedures for the faith for all time. They point to scriptures that speak of these events in the past tense. Remember I told you it's critical when you look at scripture to look at the tense of the verbs. Those who believe the gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues, all the things that make people nervous ended in the first century. Point to scriptures like this one, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works, past tense. Signs of the true apostle, one of the twelve, were performed, past tense, in the past by the twelve. Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us who heard, while God also bore witness, past tense, by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This passage speaks of the Trinity, God the Father, Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all attesting to the message of salvation. And again, they use the word bore in past tense. In addition, those who heard attested to it, describing the wonders, the miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the past tense. It's interesting. They argue that when the Holy Spirit fell and tongues were spoken, it was always in the presence of Jews. Always in the presence of believers and those seeking. When the Spirit fell, sometimes tongues were spoken, sometimes they weren't. Tongues were a sign for the Jews. In other words, what people would say is, look, there was a time in the first century before the Word of God was available, after Jesus had been here, after the Holy Spirit had been sent, 
There was a time during the first century when the apostles were telling about Jesus, but they were dying off. The word of God was beginning to come up. And until the word of God became the sealed truth of God, during that time window, God had to manifest that the message that people were hearing came from God. Okay? And that the Jewish people in particular identified with speaking in tongues. Because every time they're around Jewish people and they needed to validate the message, they speak in tongues. Okay? So what they would say, people in the first century, is there's a point at which it's obvious the gospel message is from God. It doesn't need to be validated with miracles. The word of God is here. The word of God is authoritative. When the apostles died, so did the gifts with them. There's no need for them anymore. Now, Isaiah 28, 11. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. In other words, Isaiah the prophet is saying there's a day coming... When through a strange tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. This people are Jews, Israel. A specific promise for the Jews from the prophets that signs of tongues may be a sign just for Jewish people, they would argue. The tongues in the first century are for a foreshadowing of what we're going to see in the future. Remember when I talked about um, some of the issues related to the languages at Babel? And I said there's a day coming in the future when we all speak one language. And God corrects that challenge. Zephaniah 3, nine, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him in one accord. In addition, these people, the people who believe in the apostolic age, argue that these were signs just for the Jewish audience. And that Jesus validated that, or Paul did in Corinthians. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. In other words, the Jewish people, if they want something to be validated from God, there needs to be something with it. Miracles, God things, that sort of thing. Whereas the Greeks find that validation in wisdom. After the first century... The message was taken to the Gentiles, and they would argue that these signs were no longer necessary. The word of God was the only sign anybody needed. In fact, Jesus himself said that this generation demands a sign, but it won't be given to them. The only sign they will see is the sign of Jonah. Hmm. The Gentiles spoke in tongues so the Jews would believe the spirit had fallen on them. Maybe a unique expression for a unique audience. We have the perfect word of God. Read it and you know it's from God. You don't need a miracle to validate it. Hmm. In addition, there are other stories in Acts. 3,000 responded at Pentecost, remember? No mention of a third baptism of the tongues. 5,000 responded in Solomon's portico. No mention of the third baptism of the tongue. Simon and the believers at Samaria received the Holy Spirit by laying on of hands, but no mention of tongues. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch believed, was baptized, received the Holy Spirit, no tongues. Acts chapter 9, Paul is converted on the road to Damascus. No mention of a third baptism or tongues at his conversion. Yet later he would say he had the gift of tongues. Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer. He and his whole family believed and were baptism. No mention of the Holy Spirit falling on them in a third baptism of tongues. So many people ask, why are these examples not treated as doctrine? There were clearly many, many times when people believed in Jesus, received the first baptism, received the second baptism, and from scriptures are silent on the third baptism. They agree that there is a third baptism, but they don't believe that it happens today. They know that they're never commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. They note in this the absence of tongues, miracles. And the other thing that they would say is that the Holy Spirit doesn't come to us in an installment plan. You don't get part of the Holy Spirit and then later on they add more. You get the full Holy Spirit to do all the things God wanted you to do. You weren't partially reborn. You were fully reborn. And they would argue that the church was never a place for what would be considered second-class followers, which has happened. A lot of people convince you that you're not truly spiritual if you don't speak in tongues. If you don't believe in the baptism of the Spirit for all people today, you're not a true believer. Most many people look at Paul's call to unity. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, one Lord, one faith. You are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one baptism. One God, Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. This passage is called the seven ones. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one God and Father, and one baptism. Apostolic age people point to this passage and say, look, the scriptures say there's only one universal baptism. Only one. We all at repentance were baptized in Christ and received the Holy Spirit. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one God, one Father, and one baptism. They would argue that you were fully filled at the moment that you're baptized. The moment you receive Christ, you have everything you need in the Holy Spirit. Not more to come later, you're there. We are called... Not to be baptized into the Holy Spirit, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are called to empty ourselves and make more room for God to be effective. We don't live in a transitional time when the Holy Spirit's not available to us. They would argue that miracles are no longer needed to validate the message. The scripture speaks for itself. This is God's word. It's obvious. It validates everything. There's no need for the miracles. That group constitutes a large part of evangelical Christians. The majority, actually. There's another group that says, no, 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 no. These gifts are for today. There's a third baptism today. That people, after they've received Christ, after they've been baptized in water, can seek a deeper experience and seek to be baptized in the Spirit. Like those were in uh, the temple at Pentecost. They agree that we're saved and sealed at the first baptism. We're baptized in water to connect with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But they believe that all believers should seek a third baptism. A baptism of the Holy Spirit that empowers them to share the gospel. Just like the first century people. They state that without this third baptism of the Spirit, we can't fully accomplish the mission we've been given. They would argue that just like Jesus told the disciples, don't go forward until you've received the power of the Spirit, that that was for us as well. And almost always when pressed, they will say that the third baptism is always manifested by speaking in tongues. Some incorrectly move to the extreme and say that without tongues, you're not saved. Really, really bad theology. Everyone agrees whether there are two or three baptisms, all are done in some way by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus at repentance washes us in his blood through the Holy Spirit. Baptism in water is a physical representation to the world of the cleansing Jesus has brought to us. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. They work in tandem. The Holy Spirit can't baptize us in anything without the participation of Jesus. We are spiritually baptized once, and then we should continually position ourselves to receive all that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. So what are we going to do with all this? You know, you start studying the scriptures, and you're like, yeah, they did stop in the first century. Then you go a little bit further, and you go, wait a minute, maybe they didn't. That's called denominations. It sounds a lot like domination, if you ever think about it. I believe God could have made this a whole lot clearer. Just saying. I think something is lost between the first and the 21st century. I think there's issues between translation and Greek and Hebrew to English. I've studied this topic for years, as you can imagine. I easily understand how people can look at these scriptures and totally disagree. I get it. But I have discovered that if something's not clear in scripture, it's because that's the way God wants it. There's enough in scripture for every believer to find common ground. Remember that unity does not mean uniformity. God made it very clear and undeniable that the first baptism is the defining moment for every believer spiritually and every believer experiences it at repentance and receives the Holy Spirit and is born again. True repentance and trust in Jesus makes us new spiritual beings, eternally secure the Holy Spirit now living in us. That our first step of obedience is baptism in water. We should desire to be completely filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered, gifted, use our lives to witness to other people. We should seek unity. We should submit to one another in areas where Scripture is not clear. Everyone agrees that there have been three baptisms. The debate is whether or not there are three today. God clearly gave a very special gift to the first century church, and it clearly jump-started the gospel message. And he validated his message with miracles because there wasn't any other way to validate it. They knew God was working in their midst because of the miracles. As soon as the Jews saw them speaking in tongues, they said, hey, that's what happened to us. That's of God. But at the end of the first century, the scriptures validated the message of God. Scriptures say everything you need to know about me that I want you to know, you'll find in this book. With scriptures in our hands, we have everything we need to know to know that the message of the gospel is from God. I don't need a miracle to occur in my life when I've read the message and see that my life is a miracle. Many argue that we no longer need the demonstrative miracles when the gospel's being shared. We all want a deeper experience. Every one of us wants everything the Holy Spirit brings to us. That's what we call all in. But we have to be warned and careful if we start relying on experiences alone. We can be so engrossed in having an experience that we can be wowed by anything. Jesus warned us not to become enamored with signs. For false prophets and false apostles will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. In other words, what he's saying, and I think is a fair translation, is if all you care about is speaking in tongues, anybody can lead you astray. Let me just, I don't want you to raise your hands, but here's what I want you to think. How many of you have been around a believer that said, I can teach you to speak in tongues? Don't worry. We're going to study the gifts of the Spirit. Next week, we're going to talk about tongues. I know you're going to like that. Here's the thing. The gifts are only given by the Holy Spirit. Nobody gives a gift out except the Holy Spirit as he desires and he wishes. Okay? But we're warned, don't be wowed by scriptural truths. 
Don't be wowed by signs and wonders. This book is wonder enough, they would say. God and his sovereignty to us, perhaps less than we desire on this topic. But I think it forces us to deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit. He teaches all things. We're on a need-to-know basis. There are areas, however, where I think Satan attacks the church. The last thing Satan wants is for us to actually use the power that we've been given. And honestly, he doesn't care how we, not, how we don't use it as long as we don't use it. That's how I see the church today on this topic. We're walking around, we have all the power in the world available to us, but we argue about where we should plug in and how we should plug in. And, and should we plug in? We've been given all the power we need, but instead of plugging in and using it, we spend our lives arguing about which plug we should use. We develop denominations, we divide. The charisphobics all the time not plugging in until they can prove they're right. And they're more concerned about being right than they are about being effective. The charisphobics say these signs are of Satan. The charismaniacs say those that don't have them aren't saved. While they argue with each other, Satan keeps both groups from being effective. And he uses their arguing to tell a non-believer that the Bible's flawed and we can't even get along. As a result, millions of Christians walk around with the Holy Spirit, but with no power. So let me suggest a better alternative for remnant. Let's give up our right to be right. Let's acknowledge that scriptures here are challenging. Let's think the best of those that disagree with our view. Let's focus and die on what's clear. Repent, receive the first baptism. Be baptized in water, the second baptism. Receive the Holy Spirit. Desire and pursue being completely filled with the Holy Spirit. Whatever manifestation or manner he decides he wants to do that in. Let's remember that those who disagree with our view, your view, within this room, maybe within your family, maybe next person sitting next to you, they love Jesus too. They aren't just pursuing what they believe scripture says on this topic, and I dare say it, if they don't agree with you in areas of scripture where God has allowed that room, it's okay. What I clearly don't understand is how anyone can honestly look at all these scriptures given to us by God and be absolutely sure of either as the only correct answer. I told you, if you're going to study the Bible, you've got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. We're on a need-to-know basis, and on this topic, we know enough. I don't think there is a correct answer. Totally. Uh, there is. I just don't think God wants us to know what it is. If you're absolutely sure one direction or the other, I encourage you to keep studying until you're not. This is one of those areas of Scripture I've learned to be comfortable getting uncomfortable. I could come up here for an hour or two hours or three hours and I could spend the entire time trying to convince you based on scripture that the gift stopped in the first century and I could do it very effectively. I could also get up here and convince you that it happens today and I can do that very effectively. And neither of those would be off topic. Neither of those would be doing gymnastics with scripture. What we can't do is insert into scripture what God has chosen to leave out. I trust he knows the answer. And in faith, I understand that I'm on a need-to-know basis. On this topic, the scriptures provide what we need to know to take the next step of faith. Repent, be baptized, be born again, be water baptized, and then seek to have every ounce of the Holy Spirit in you that you can have. At Remnant, we will gladly lay hands on you and pray whatever it takes, call it a baptism, call it being filled, call it an anointing, call it more of God, call it less of me. I don't care what you call it, I really don't. It doesn't matter to me. What I care about is that you pursue the Holy Spirit with everything you have.
that you make sure that you are positioned, ready, and willing to receive everything he wants to give you. To experience everything Jesus had planned for you. An honest, open discussion of Scripture can get you leaning in either direction. I can clearly see how those who believe in a third baptism as a normal expectation can study Scripture and come to that conclusion with good intention. And a heart that loves Jesus. And desperately want to know and teach only truth. I can also see how those who believe in one baptism in the Holy Spirit was for a window of time come to their conclusion based on Scripture. They, too, have good intentions. They, too, are honest about studying God's Word. They have a heart that loves Jesus, and they desperately want to know and only teach truth. I get it. As for my experience, I have family members, friends, pastors, people in our church who point to a flashpoint moment when the Spirit of God flooded them and they say they spoke in tongues. Still do. They would say they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll say, and we'll get into this next week, most people I know who say they speak in tongues speak in a prayer tongue, and we'll talk about the difference next week. I have family members, friends, pastors, and people in our church who believe the gifts were a first century event, that there was a time when God had to validate his message supernaturally, and that they consider that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not a baptism, but just a surrender, and that you don't have to speak in tongues, and there doesn't need to be any manifestation of it. Now, I'm on a journey. I'm open to whatever God wants to do. The day God called me to leave this church, lead this church, um, I felt an overflow of the Holy Spirit pour out on me. It was a huge flashpoint in my life. It was an overwhelming experience that was life transforming. Was that a baptism of the Spirit? I don't know. I don't think about it very much. I didn't speak in tongues, but what I did receive was a huge dose of faith. Faith that God was in control, faith that God was calling me, faith that God would make this vision happen, faith that he would show up and work through us. I didn't need to speak in tongues, I needed faith. And the Holy Spirit gave me what I needed to be the best witness for Jesus. Let me just go through this real quick and then we'll realize how long this was. The writer of Hebrews tells us to move on. Hebrews 6.1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Let us leave the elementary teachings and go on to maturity. Let's don't keep rehashing the events. Let's move on to what God wants us to do. Now, we're a non-denominational church. We have learned to work together in areas where Scripture is not clear. Essentially telling each other, it's cool. Just use one of the plugs. Just use one of them. But make sure you receive the power that God has for you. Let me close with this. Ephesians, Paul's talking. Look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's just be wise. The scriptures aren't crystal clear here. Let's make the best use of our time. How many more days or hours do you have? Do you really want to get to heaven and tell Jesus that you wasted your time arguing? When you could have been witnessing? The days are evil. Of course, Satan's trying to confuse us. If we waste our time arguing, we're not going to be effective. We've been given the most powerful gift ever given to humans. Wouldn't it make sense that Satan would want us divided on it? Paul says, therefore, don't be foolish. Know the will of the Lord. Understand the will of the Lord. What is the will of the Lord? Next verse. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and give thanks always to the Lord. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We're to pursue being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's our assignment on earth. 
submitting to one another. I'm, I'm going to give up my right to be right. I'm going to lovingly correct on areas of doctrine that are clear, but in those areas where it's not, where we have to walk in faith and not certainty, I submit that either of us could be right. And out of reverence to Jesus, I'm going to encourage and support you. Call it a third baptism. Call it being filled with the Holy Spirit. Call it receiving a strong anointing. Call it experiencing more of the Holy Spirit that you already have. Call it surrender more in order to experience more. We can agree to disagree on what we call it. What we must do, however, is help each other pursue it. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you've given us your word. And if you wanted to make this topic crystal clear, you'd have done it. But I think you want to see if we'll walk in unity without having to be uniform. I think you want us to see if we'll submit to your authority and not our own. I think you want us to understand that your word is your word, not ours. God, help us to love each other. Help us to not get lost in foolish arguments. God, I pray that every one of us experiences the first baptism, no matter what. And the people in our lives who haven't experienced that, our job, our mission, our passion, the reason our hearts are still beating is because people need to know Jesus and be saved. God, help us to focus on that part of the mission. And then God, would you allow us to just focus on our own lives for a while and see if there's any pushback we have with the Holy Spirit wanting to do something in us? Whether we call it anointing or baptism, it doesn't matter. The question is, have we surrendered and allowed the Holy Spirit to do all he wants to do? Are we at that point in our lives when we can say anything, anytime, any cost, anywhere? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.